Greetings, friends, in the name of Christ our King. I just give God glory and honor for the privilege to present his word to you once again. We are in the middle of the holiday season. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and soon to be a happy new year. Uh, and God has been good to us. Imagine all of the craziness of the year. And we are uh, blessed to see the end of it and stand on the verge or on the cusp of a new year. And so God uh, has been faithful to us. And we thank him for his goodness and his mercy and his faithfulness um, and him protecting and keeping us all year long. I can't uh, think of a year more challenging uh, than the one we've had now. Um, and so uh, for us to be here, no reason to complain, but to tell God thank you. If you have a thank you down in your spirit, can you type that into the comments now before we get into the message? Can somebody just type and just tell God thank you? For his goodness, his mercy, his kindness, or perhaps tell him thank you for something he's done for you personally. Uh, testify in the comments. We don't have testimony service uh, too much anymore, at least in the way we used to. And so testify to your digital neighbor and tell him thank you, Jesus, or God has been good. Uh, tell somebody why. Tap in the comments. Maybe he woke you up this morning. Maybe uh, the old people used to say started us on our way. Our seniors used to say, or baby, um, he protected you and your children. Whatever your testimony is, I just want to see it in the comments right now. Flood the comments with the goodness of God. I'm excited about uh, this lesson and this message I want to give to you today. Uh, I'm sure many of you watching have heard the Christmas narrative, the Christmas story. Uh, there's so many angles that you can come from, but if you stick and walk with God uh, long enough, his word um, uh, can always show you something new and different. It can take you deeper into the word of God. And so um, we know the birth narrative for the most part of Jesus. Somebody's watching, I hope, is hearing some of it for the first time. Uh, but for those of you who know the story, uh, I kind of want to come at it a little different today. Uh, in the story or the birth narrative of Jesus between Matthew 1 and Luke 1, there are a number of characters uh, that play a part or play a role uh, in Jesus' birth narrative and his story. Uh, and even some years afterward, uh, although um, it wasn't technically when Jesus was born, for example, we like to say the Magi or a number of our Christmas cards and uh, some of the uh, movies we've seen, we see the Magi sitting there with baby Jesus on the night he was born with the star overlooking it. Well, uh, truth be told, that was actually probably a couple of years later, but we still like to connect it with the birth narrative, and you'll see me do that here as well, so that's fine. But um, um, there are a number of characters surrounding the birth narrative of Jesus that played a part or played a role in bringing God's plan into fulfillment. For example, you will see uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary. You will see the mother and father of John the Baptist, Elizabeth and Zechariah. We talked about them a little last week in dealing with John the Baptist. You will see uh, John the Baptist uh, around the birth narrative of Jesus. His role in that is important as well. You will also see uh, Magi coming from the east. You will uh, see King Herod. You will see shepherds in the fields keeping watch over their flocks at night. All of these people play a role in the birth narrative of Jesus, playing a, a, a part in the plan of God to bring his promise into fulfillment. Uh, but one person I think that can be overlooked that I didn't list, and that's who I want to talk about today, is Joseph. And that's Jesus' father, Joseph. I want to talk to you about the average Joe. Um, and so uh, this is Joseph, father of Jesus. He's the average Joe. And let's see what the Bible uh, tells us about him as we read from Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. And then we're going to read up to verse 25. It'll conclude the chapter. Okay? So Matthew 1, starting at verse 18, and then we'll read through the chapter. And the chapter ends at verse Number 25. All right. It says, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, this is how 
the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Well, that's a powerful opening there. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she, found, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. I love the way this opens like a soap opera. Okay, okay this is how the birth of, of Jesus the Messiah came about. In other words, I can imagine someone um, in, in, in my mind's eye saying, look, let me tell you what really happened. What had happened was, okay, so what had happened was Mary, his mother, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was already pe pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. And he gave him the name Jesus. So for uh, an idea, just to wrap our minds around uh, an umbrella topic or to help bring these thoughts together and keep them organized, let's think around the idea, meet the average Joe, subtopic, it's bigger than me. Can you do me a favor and write that in the comments right now? Meet the average Joe. It's bigger than me. Jesus, I thank you for your word. As we read it, it has already sprung to life into the hearts and spirits of your people. I thank you that you will continue to feed us your spiritual nourishment now. Feed us, Father, and we will be satisfied. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. So I thank you, Father, that life is springing forth as we speak and declare and proclaim your word. We love you and we sit in anticipation for what your spirit is getting ready to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, the, the story, uh, the birth story of Jesus is fascinating that because God chose to use different people in different stages of their life. On one end of the spectrum, he decided to use Elizabeth and Zechariah, who are in their senior and elder years, to birth John the Baptist, who would be the forerunner of Jesus. But on the other end of the spectrum, we see God using a teenage girl and a young man in their early young adult years, based on Jewish culture. In their early young adult years, he decides to call them and use them to birth Jesus and to take care of him until it is time for him to begin his earthly ministry. On one end of the uh, spectrum, we have an older man and an older woman who cannot have children. On the other end, we have a young man and a young woman who are in the prime of their childbearing years in this culture. On one end of the spectrum, we have shepherds keeping watch over their flocks at night. Uh, on the other end, we have magi coming from the east. Uh, in my mind's eye, uh, I could see the magi being well-to-do uh, men in the upper echelon economically in their society. They could travel and make a long trek across the east to find Jesus and to follow this star. 
and apparently they were important enough to receive audience with the king to ask, where can we find the one to be born who will be king of the Jews? So on one end, we have just average shepherds keeping watch over their flocks at night. On the other end, we have men who seem to be on the higher end, on who were what some people call uppity, on the uppity end of society. We have an old couple and we have a young couple, people in different areas of their lives, different seasons of their lives. Yet God uses them all and brings them all together to accomplish his plan and his purpose. I'm excited about that. Joseph, of all the characters in the birth narrative of Jesus, has always been fascinating to me. It has always fascinated me whenever I would read the story of Joseph, because if you ever read the birth narrative of Jesus, I always felt like, man, talk about a guy who just got a raw deal. Seems like somebody who drew the short end of the straw. If it was anybody, it, it would seem like Joseph, father of Jesus, drew the short end of the straw or the short end of the stick. Like God called him to do a lot and used him for a lot. But when it came time, it seems like God forgot about him. And so Joseph has always fascinated me. So we pick up in the life of this young teen, this young adult man, and uh, he's in process. He, if he's uh, anything like Jesus, he's the, a carpenter as well because Oftentimes in this society, people would do things in families. Uh, their families would be responsible for certain gifts. You would see a family would be a family of Levites, a family who took care of trees and who are uh, a family who uh, specialized in viticulture, a family who specialized um, in certain agriculture, a family who specialized in keeping livestock and herds. And so this family, if, if, if that holds true, Jesus, we know, uh, dealt with carpentry in some sense, and, and Joseph was probably a carpenter as well. So let's just say this young man is getting started in life. He just got out of technical school, maybe just got out of Job Corps. Uh, maybe he just uh, got his associates and he's uh, getting into carpentry and he's just getting started and he's being betrothed and he's been promised marriage to this young woman by the name of Mary. But now, let's take a list of some of these things in the life of Joseph that just, just would shock and appall me. Uh, but look at this. Before Joseph and Mary uh, get married, Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here you, because you know the story by now. Joseph finds out Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And when he decides that he wants to divorce her quietly. These are the passages we read today. Matthew 1, verse 18 through 25, as somebody just logged on. Before he decides he wants to leave her, God says, no, I've called you to take care of a child that is technically not yours. Problem number one. So now he's asked by God to take care of a son who technically is not his, technically. Biologically, this is not his son. Biologically, Jesus does not possess the DNA of his father, Joseph. Okay? And we'll maybe deal with that on one Wednesday night as to why um, um, the Immaculate Conception is so important uh, in our theology. But for now, Joseph is technically not Jesus' father. And so God calls him to take care of something that technically is not his. Then not only that, uh, perhaps you can hear the talk around town with Mary. She's already got a baby bump. Maybe she's starting to show. Uh, I don't know. Um, and the talk around town is Mary's pregnant, maybe. And he took care of a woman. Now he's called to take care of, not, of a baby that's not his. Now he's called to take care of a woman with, uh, in less than reputable circumstances. Let's put it like that. A woman whose reputation might be uh, a little on the darker side in this small town. 
We often like to think uh, in this time period, we, we like to bring our 21st century vernacular to the text. But keep in mind, these aren't sprawling metropolises like we see today with millions and hundreds of thousands of people in them. Uh, these are small towns with hundreds, maybe thousands of people in them, maybe. Uh, but we know there's, there was a few hundreds of people in the town. And so uh, word could get around. You knew Mary from around the way. You knew Joseph from around the way. And, and, and you know this, you, you may be a woman, man, somebody saw her with the morning sickness. Or perhaps, uh, I don't know, she just has that pregnant look. Has anybody ever known that pregnant look? A number of people have testified, and my wife has testified uh, as well. When Before people would announce in our church they were pregnant, we would always kind of know. Or before my wife and I announced uh, formally to our church that she was with child, there are people who say, yeah, we kind of know. There's just some signs <laughs> when you look at a mother. Maybe she's a little swollen. She looks a little pale. Uh, maybe certain parts of her body are, are enlarged. And you just kind of know. So maybe there's some signs there and people just knew. And so now Joseph is called to take care of a child who's technically not his. And now he's called to be connected with a woman who may be a bad report or, 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 or a bad reputation. So fine, I, I, I'll do those two. But then at least Joseph can say, all right, once we get through this nine months, once we get through this baby, raise this baby, I'll still have a wife, we'll still get married. I'll, I'll still get to enjoy my wife. That's fine. But look at this. All of a sudden, God tells him to do something. We see it in verse number 25. But he, that is Joseph, did not consummate their marriage until he gave birth to a son. So all of a sudden now, I have to take care of a child that's technically, technically not mine. I have to be with this woman who doesn't have the best reputation uh, right now, and I want to divorce her quietly. But, but now I can't even consummate my marriage. I can't even enjoy sexual pleasures with my wife. I'll pause there on purpose. Because I don't know if I would have signed up, but it would have been able to sign up for this plan outside of an angel of the Lord come to me as well. He made a, my God might have had to, instead of just a dream, he might have had to come to me in physical form. Because a dream, I maybe would have signed it off as I was something I ate. But, but now we see why God had to come to Joseph in a dream. Because so far he has three reasons as to why he should walk out of this thing. Then, after all of that, we know Joseph didn't have sex with his wife for at least nine months. So, fine. It wasn't until after jo uh, G uh, Mary gave birth to Jesus. So, he couldn't even enjoy, enjoy his wife sexually. So, all of a sudden now, he couldn't enjoy uh, his wife sexually. Then, look, if you look at the Luke 1 narrative that is attached to the Matthew 1 narrative, uh, depending on how you read it. Now, Luke is one of the longest chapters, of course, uh, in the Bible. So, a lot goes on in Luke uh, chapter 1. But the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 56, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for at least three months. So a trimester of the pregnancy was spent separated from her husband. Okay, so now I, I am charged to take care of a woman that that is uh, that doesn't have the best reputation. I'm in charge of taking care of a child that technically is not mine. I can't enjoy my wife sexually for at least the first nine months, and she's distant from me. I can't even be in her presence. She's away with the family for a trimester, for a third of the pregnancy. Is anybody beginning to get the, the, the sense that maybe Joseph has drawn the short end of the straw? So Joseph now doesn't see his wife for three months. All right, so now, fine, I'll get through all of that. Let's give birth to this baby. All right, they give birth to the baby. And it wasn't like... They gave birth to the baby in the best circumstances. They are called now to travel and go back home based on um, <clears throat> a decree given that the entire Roman world, everything that was under the Roman Empire was going to be taxed. And so they had to take a census. Anytime you take a census, it's because they're getting ready to bring in some new taxes. They want to make sure their money's right. So they said, let's take a census. Everybody go back to their hometown. Because at some point, probably a tax was coming. And so they travel 
uh, back home. And God works in mysterious ways, and he uses this. Uh, he works through this legislative system, through, through some, some laws that says go back home. And God works that out to fulfill his promise and his prophecy through this traveling back home through this trip, but when they get there, you would think they're doing God a favor. After all, they are charged with taking care of and caring for God incarnate, for bringing God's plan into fulfillment in this New Testament. So you would think God would do them a favor. God, please give me a Marriott. Give me a Hilton. God, please give me uh, a beautiful hotel, you, you know, with, 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 with the best stay with, with some great staff, but there's no room in the end. We know the Christmas story. So not only do I have to take care of a baby that's not mine, not only do I have to not see my wife for three months, not only can I not enjoy my wife sexually for at least nine months, but now you're telling me, not only am I taking care of a woman with a bad reputation, but now you're telling me when I do get home, you don't even have the best thing worked out for me. I have to get home and make do and give birth to my baby in a barn. So fine, that's four or five things, but maybe those are just coincidences and my life will get better now. I'm, you think I'm just talking, but I'm just laying this story out so you can get this list in your mind. I just have one big point today and then I'm done. Fine, he says, let me just, let's just give birth to this baby. Then things will get easier after that. Wife will be in a better mood. Once the pregnancy is over, things will get a little easier. But the Bible says just the opposite. When Jesus is born, maybe about a, a, a year or two later, some magi come from the east and they alert King Herod saying there is someone born who is going to be king. And keep in mind that, that Herod does have some background in, in, in Judaism. Okay, and so we could prove that through scripture, but he does have uh, some background in Judah because he is part Idumean. And so he does have some background in it. So this, he knows enough to ask, where does the prophecy say the child will be born? So they search the scriptures. He believes it enough to recognize he needs to stop this plan. But, but apparently he didn't understand it fully because he was foolish enough to think he could thwart the plan of God. So now he's sending people after Jesus so that he may kill him. So now he can't find him. So he says, fine, here's what I'll do. I'll just kill everybody. So potentially there's tens of 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 children were killed. I know we like to think in our minds that there are thousands upon thousands, but that was more than likely probably not true just based on the population in their area of that time. So maybe, maybe up to 100 children, but probably just in the tens, in the 40s, 50s, maybe 30 children, families crying out to God who are sad because their child has been slaughtered. And you've never seen pain like the pain of a parent crying when their, children is, when their child is dead. There's no pain like the pain of someone having to bury their child or having to expect a child, and then that child is killed. We see in other passages of scripture where it was not uncommon for them to rip babies from the wombs of pregnant mothers or to abuse and, and, and beat the mothers who, are show, who have shown they are with child until they know the baby is dead. We can see that in other passages of scripture. This was a brutal time period. And so you would think it would get easier, but now they have to go on the run. And they have to go on the run, so now I have to take care of a child who's technically not mine. I have to take care of a woman with a bad reputation. I can't enjoy her sexually. I miss her for a third of the pregnancy, and, and she's away from me. I don't get to sit down and enjoy my life with the baby. And so now I'm on the run, and I have to flee from danger. Glory to God. And I have to relocate, move to another place, and I have to escape down to Egypt. And then later on, I have to come up out of Egypt and go back into my hometown. So I'm moving. I'm, I'm, it's kind of like I'm nomadic. And we see this in the life of Jesus. We see Jesus uh, uh, 
in the New Testament, he kind of is a type of what Israel was in the Old Testament, or perhaps maybe Israel, uh, the people of Israel and, and the children of Israel and Moses were a type or a shadow of Jesus. And so the same way they were nomadic and they wondered and they, and they eventually came up out of Egypt. Likewise, Jesus and his parents were nomadic and they wondered and eventually they came up out of Egypt. And you'll know the scriptures fulfilled. You'll see where it says, out of Egypt, I have called my son. So now they're escaping and they're moving and they're going through and, to, and living in a number of places. So this child was responsible for Joseph's relocation to Bethlehem, to Egypt, and to Nazareth, at least three places that we see in Scripture. And then perhaps Joseph wanted to live in a nice part of town. Perhaps he wanted to live somewhere uh, a little nice, but no, he couldn't live in the nicest places. He had to move somewhere where he could not be found. Joseph perhaps wanted to live in Judea, but, but it stopped him from living there because he was afraid of that leader. And that leader could possibly bring harm to Jesus and his family. And so Joseph, you'll see this in scripture, and I don't have time to give references for all these things. You'll perhaps you'll see them on your screen. Joseph wanted to live in a certain place, but he couldn't do it because of the well-being of his family. He wanted to make sure that was intact, so he had to live in a certain place. And so Joseph doesn't get to live where he wants to live. He doesn't get seemingly what he wants. But this is the one, one I'm going to keep going here. This is one that, that really gets me. The Bible says that, that Joseph, Jesus' father, is the 41st in the line of King David. So technically, this is why Matthew 1 opens with the lineage of Jesus, and you should look at that lineage. It's so important to see what all is in fam the family of Jesus, what all is in Jesus' bloodline. G Joseph is 41st in the line of King David. So technically, Joseph has royalty in his lineage. His forefathers knew what it was to be sitting on the throne as king. And if things had gone according to plan, Joseph should be king in Israel. Technically, Joseph should be sitting on a throne. His forefather was David, Solomon, all these great kings. You'll see them listed in Matthew 1. These are his forefathers. He should be on a throne. He should have riches. He should have fame. He should have world renown. Joseph, Jesus' his father. But it skips his generation. And seemingly what's worse, it's not promised to him, but it's promised to his son. He receives a promise, the prophetic declarations that his son will rule and reign again and be the king. Now, he won't sit on a physical throne, we know, but he will sit on a spiritual throne and reign over all of the universe. But imagine Joseph hearing that for the first time. And you're hearing, wow. Wow. My forefathers were kings, and it seems like the, the royal lineage will be restored, but not in my time, in the time of my son. My goodness. So now Joseph, let's go down the list again, has to take care of a child that's technically not his. He has to take care of a woman of bad reputation. He can't enjoy her sexually for at least nine months. She's gone for at least a third of the pregnancy. He can't live in the neighborhood that he wants. He runs from danger. Uh, he doesn't, his, his, his child and is not birthed in the best of circumstances. If anybody has a reason to complain, it's Joseph. But finally, once we hear Joseph in Matthew 1, Matthew 2, parts of Matthew 2, and then we hear of him in Luke 1 and parts of Luke 2, after Luke 2, we no longer hear of Joseph, father of Jesus, again. He seemingly, he, he moves, not seemingly, he does. He is moved off of the pages of scripture. He disappears. Most uh, theologians believe and Bible historians believe that Joseph probably died. Last we see of him is when Jesus uh, is 12 years old. 
And so after that, we believe that Joseph has died, but, but you would think if someone did so much for God, was willing to submit to so much of God's plan, you would think God would, would, would waste a full chapter on my life. You think God would give me a chapter. After all, he gave John the Baptist a birth narrative. After all, we saw John the Baptist's ending. We know how he passed away. After all, we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, in certain portions of his ministry as he, gets, as he moves into adulthood. She maintains a portion of the, in the story, a, a section in the story. But it would seem like someone who gave up so much for God is moved, escorted off of the pages of Scripture, never to be mentioned again. And this is why all of these reasons, these 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I don't even list them all because I feel like I'm running out of time. All of these reasons, it what, it's what leads me to the place where I say, did Joseph get a raw deal? This average Joe, who technically shouldn't be so average, his, his forefathers are kings. He's living the, what we would deem to be an average life, what we would declare to be an average life. He just has a son. They don't seem to live in the best neighborhoods. Their, his son is birthed in, in tough circumstances. And it would seem like God did Joseph wrong. But I said all of that to lead you to this point. And here's the whole point of the message today. Here's a question I have of you, for you. Can God call you and trust you to be a part of something bigger than you and can you be satisfied when you don't receive any special acknowledgement can God call you to be a part of something greater than yourself bigger than you can he call you to pay a play a part a portion a piece in the play and you be satisfied with your part and you move off the scene. Or, or does your name always have to be on the marquee? Does your name have to be on the building outside in light saying starring Gabriel Madison, starring Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, John Doe and Jane Doe? Does your name always have to be mentioned? Do you always need special recognition? Do you always need a pat on the back? Or can God call you to be a part of something greater than you? Because I have news for you. Everybody that I mentioned, every character that is mentioned in the birth narrative of Jesus, it's someone who was willing to play their part in a, in a, in a much, grand, much grander scheme and people who are willing to walk off the scene and never be mentioned again. Glory to God. Everybody that is mentioned in the birth narrative of Jesus is someone who was willing to play their role and move off of the scene. Look at this. Let me give you some characters. Watch this. John the Baptist, we talked about him recently. When it came time for him to end his part in this plan and, and, and move off the scene, he was just the forerunner of Jesus. He was preparing the way for the king. According to ancient Middle Eastern customs, remember that whenever a king was going to travel, he would send forerunners ahead of him to smooth out the ground and keep, uh, uh, keep eyes open out for bandits or people who would try to do him and his traveling party harm. So they would make the way and prepare the way for the king before he traveled. So likewise, King Jesus was coming. John the Baptist was the forerunner. He prepared the way for the king. Remember that? And when it came time for the king to come, John the Baptist says, he must be greater than I must become less. 
Or how about this? Uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, Luke 138. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Notice the first thing on her mind wasn't, uh, what am I going to get out of this? Does this prophecy have to end in me getting a car, getting a house, getting something, getting a famous name, a special promise? Or can she just say, can you just say, like Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Magi who came from the east to give gifts to a child they didn't even know. And then they left never to be heard from again. They played and the background, they faded into the background. Or how about when Jesus is being blessed? How about when it comes time for him to be dedicated as the firstborn in Luke chapter 2? And you see Simeon there, and you see Anna there, and they are there waiting on the fulfillment of this prophecy of the Messiah to come. And once they see the fulfillment of this prophecy, they speak into this young man and this young woman's life saying, take care of this child, this is a special baby, and we never hear from them again. They give their prophecy, and they move off of the scene. We don't hear about Anna, and we don't hear about Simeon again. Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, when she meets Mary, and many theologians uh, believe, based on some extra-biblical resources, that John the Baptist possibly could have been dead in her womb. And when she meets uh, Mary, the, 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 uh, and she's birthed, uh, with, and she has, she's carrying Jesus, the Bible says all of a sudden it quickens her body, and, 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 and John the Baptist is filled with the Spirit. Mary said, or Elizabeth says, blessed, be, blessed is the child you will, we will bear. Watch this. And why am I so favored? that the mother of my Lord should come to meet me. In other words, Elizabeth was blessed with a child, but she knew that her child was only the opening act. She said, blessed be the mother of my Lord. She knew she was a part of a much bigger plan. She just played a role, just played a part, just played a piece in something much greater than her and her husband and their child. She knew she was a part of God's great plan. My God. Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. God comes to him and meets him while he's by the altar praying. And Zechariah was silenced until he came into agreement with the plan of God. Once Zechariah's mouth was opened after his son was birthed, the only thing he could, be, he could proclaim was the plan that was bigger than himself. Watch this. He says, the horn, a horn of salvation has been raised up in the line of David. So somehow, somewhere, I don't know when exactly it happened. The Bible doesn't let us know, but his declaration reveals that he recognized he was a part of a much bigger plan. He, he played a, his role in the scheme of things, but he recognized the plan was much bigger than him. And then look, he says, I'm going to name my son John. And he said, his son John will prepare the way for the Most High. So in other words, when he opened his mouth, he came to the realization that in his nine months of silence, he was a part of something much bigger than him. And I have questions for you. Can God trust you to be a part of something bigger than you? Even Jesus said, I'm a part of something bigger than me. This story of Christmas had to do with everyone sacrificing something. Joseph, Jesus' father, sacrificing his reputation, sacrificing a certain season of his life, sacrificing living somewhere uh, he possibly he didn't want to live, sacrificing being a part of a plan 
that he maybe had different plans in his life, sacrificing, being separated from his wife from three months for a trimester, for a third of the pregnancy. Maybe for a season it was kind of tough on his marriage dealing with all of this, the strain on his relationship dealing with all of this. Mary sacrificed her reputation. Zachariah sacrificed his mouth for nine months, sacrificed a portion of his life, sacrificed what would he normally have called his child, something else. But he surrendered through a plan of God, said, I'll name my son John. Elizabeth sacrificed something. The Magi sacrificed time, effort, and energy joined to see Jesus. The shepherds in the fields keeping watch over their flock at night, they sacrificed something. They said, let's lead the sheep or let's go put them away and let's go see this one who was born king, who is the Messiah. Everyone sacrificed something to bring about the plan of God. And I want you to know today that there is a, a grand plan that God has set up and established. And this plan was put in place before the found, from the foundations of the world. As a matter of fact, I'll reveal to you later on as we move to this signs that God had a plan in place before we even needed it. And this large, this, this grand plan that you and I are a part of, we all have a role to play. Some's role, some people's role are bigger than others. I'm not going to lie about that now. I know we promise greatness, but we have to redefine what greatness is. Greatness is doing your part that God has called you to do on your level. So greatness is if I'm called to pastor, minister to 50. Greatness is if I'm called to pastor, and minister to 10, I'm faithful to those 10 or to those 50. Greatness is if I'm called just to minister to the people in my neighborhood. Greatness is if I'm never called to do missions around the world, go across seas and oceans and go to distant nations. But if I'm called to minister to people right here in my zip code, in my area code, in my neighborhood, in my locale, I'm faithful to that assignment. I'm like John the Baptist. If this is what I'm called to do, just be the forerunner and bring on a baptism of repentance. If I'm called like Mary to just carry the baby for nine months, if I'm called like Joseph to just make sure the child is safe in, in a, in a, in a male-dominated uh, 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 patriarchal society to keep him safe until he comes of adult age, which is about 13, and we see Jesus at 12, and then we don't hear of his father anymore. Maybe I was just called to get him to adulthood, and then I move off the scene. That's the role I'm going to play. God needs someone who says, I'll just play my role in this play. I'll play my part in his heavenly and his divine production. And if this is the role I'm called to play, I'll play this role. And if I, only, if I look through the entire script and I don't see any more lines for Gabriel Madison, I'm just called to play this part, this section in history. It's what I'm called to play. I'll just play my part and I'll move off the scene. And I'll be satisfied with my role because I've got news for you. Whether you're called to minister to millions or if you're called to minister to 10 people, if you do it as faithful as the one who's called to minister to millions, you still receive the same well done, my good and faithful servant. When you get to heaven, your reward and their reward will be the same because it won't be based on the amount. We see this in too many passages of scripture. We can use this with the parables of Jesus and, and with stewardship in Matthew 20 and the parable of the talents. Whether you're giving one talent, two talents, or five talents, it, it's not the amount. He's looking at your faithfulness. And if you are faithful to play your role, you average Joe, or if you are faithful to maintain your integrity while your name was in the headlines, while your name was on the marquee and your name was in the big lights, whatever your role was, if you are faithful to that, God 
will reward you based on your faithfulness. It's bigger than me. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Hide it in our heart. Thank you for reminding us that you've called each of us to do something. Each of us has a role to play. We're just like the average Joe. Father, we may not have some great athletic talent to be an NBA player. We may not have some great speaking gift to be a world-renowned preacher, prophet. We may not have some unique ability that makes us world famous or gives us millions and billions of dollars and adds to our net worth. But Father, you've given us each a role and a purpose and a gift and a unique part to play in your plan. So Jesus, I ask that you would help us to be faithful to what you've called us to do. I thank you, Lord, for reminding us of our part in your plan. Thank you for sending your son Jesus into the world, being born to ultimately die. We love you and we praise you for all that you are doing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you're watching at home and you are not in relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus came to this earth, this planet. He was born ultimately to die and he fulfilled that purpose. He didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. He rose from the dead. And now he's alive and he can live on the inside of you. Will you just invite him in? Will you say, Jesus, come into my life? I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the dead. Save me, Jesus. Change me, Lord. Make me more like you. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer and truly meant it in your heart, you are now saved from the penalty of your sins. You are saved from the penalty of your wrongdoing. And now you get to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever when you die. Congratulations. Today is your new spiritual birthday. You have gone. Uh, the old you has died and the new spiritual you has come, has come to life. I want to hear about it. Will you direct message me on Facebook if you're watching from there? If you're watching from YouTube, would you say it in the comments and someone will contact you? Will you if you're watching on a website, go to the contact page and just fill out that form really quick. We won't share your information with anyone, perhaps one of our counselors, to let them know you've accepted, you've accepted Jesus and we want to get some free information to you. Let me know if you've accepted Jesus into your life. Congratulations. For those of you watching, I'm going to be honest, people don't get excited about messages like this, lessons like this. You don't get a lot of comments. When people often like to hear the good sermon. People often like to hear the good sermons. They're going to get something. Double for your trouble. Your blessing is coming. But I want you to mature and grow up in the faith. God will make sure that you are blessed. Trust me. You can never beat God giving. Joseph may have not got it all on this side, but I promise you, Joseph is in heaven right now enjoying his reward for his faithfulness. But I want you to grow and mature to the place that if I'm not promised anything special, I trust God with the outcome because I'll never be able to beat God in giving. So I'm going to be faithful to my assignment without any special acknowledgement. If nobody says thank you, if my name's never in lights, I'm going to be faithful to what God has called me to do. I want you to grow into mature and grow and mature into that place. I'm excited about your growth. Until we meet again, God bless you.